Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the First City Podcast. Coming to you live from First City Records, here's your host, Aaron Whited. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the very first episode of the First City Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron. I own the First City Records, and I'm happy to be part of this podcast and uh, about the mid-Ohio Valley. We're going to talk not only about what's going on in my store, but uh, things that are going on in our local community. We're going to have guests. We're going to have top five lists. We're going to have a lot of fun along the way, but this very first episode, I decided to keep it simple. I have two really great interviews uh, in the can for this episode. First one we have is Mr. Tony Workman. You know him as the owner and entrepreneur that uh, runs classic plastics toy show and the classic plastics toy store that was in the mall now it's not we're going to find out what happened with that along with we're going to you know check in on him uh and talk about mental health a little bit and uh, make sure that he's doing okay because you know a lot of things have changed for him very quickly in the last few months so stick around for that interview but we also have a great interview with miss caitlin streeter the marketing director of the people's bank theater she's going to be a recurring character here on the podcast so i want to make sure you guys had a few minutes to get to know her i think it was a great interview and i look forward to working with her going forward we're going to find out a little bit about the People's Bank Theater history and a little bit about Caitlin and her love of tap dancing and musical theater. So stick around for that. And uh, later on in the podcast, we're going to be talking about things that are going on in the store and a little bit about Record Store Day. The list was just released and a lot of people want to know what's, you know, what's on the list. So we're going to find out when we're going to talk about Record Store Day. But for now, sit back, relax and enjoy the interview with Miss Caitlin Studer of the People's Bank Theater. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back in. I want to introduce Miss Caitlin Streeter from the People's Bank Theater into the studio here. She's going to talk a little bit about uh, upcoming shows at the theater, uh, a little bit about history of the theater, and a little bit about herself as well. So let's welcome in Miss Caitlin. Hello, everyone listening. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for joining me. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks for the invite. It's a uh, beautiful day here on front street it's cool to be in your in your store in your studio sitting at this awesome retro table <laughs> that yeah, we're at we're recording this podcast on a 1980s um donkey kong cocktail table from let's say pizza hut so awesome. kind of give you the ambiance of, of the vibe here in the studio today <laughs> so hello K caitlin let's learn a little bit about you before we start talking about the theater how did you become the the uh, marketing director at the theater Oh, gosh. Well, I don't really know. It just kind of <laughs> happened. Um, I'm not originally from Marietta, but I definitely feel like Marietta is home. It, it feels like the right place to be. Just This is an awesome, awesome small town um, here on the Ohio River. And uh, yeah, I moved here in 2020. I started off as a reporter for WTAP, our local um, TV news station. And then um, after a bit, I was at the Chamber of Commerce for a while. Um, and those two jobs really got me to really get to know the area, yeah. all the people here, all the different business owners and, um, and you know, our public officials and all that jazz. Um, and in a small town like this, it's really easy to kind of quickly get to know everyone. And it's just awesome. And so, yeah, I am, I'm a theater kid. Um, I went to a theater um, school in high school. Um, so I was, you know, in all the musicals, all the plays, show choir, woman's chorus. You were in show choir. I was in show choir. Oh. <laughs> and Marietta, I was in, the, I was in premiere in high school. Awesome. Oh, give it up for show choir geeks. Yes. All right. I was an alto one. I don't remember what I was. It was 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, all right. I'm also a theater geek. Give yeah. me two or three of your favorite roles and Ooh. the one role that you always wanted to play that you didn't get to play. Okay. Okay. So the favorite uh, roles I've played, um, I, so I went to Ohio University and I was in Blythe Spirit and I played Madam, um, oh boy, Madam something, and this is horrible. Butterfly. So, no, she, um, Agatha, it was, it was an Agatha Christie play, it might be, people listening might know. But anyways, I was in Blythe Spirit, which is a, a, a play about these people who are in this, this mansion and they have this old lady who con conjure spirits and she's really kooky and crazy and a lot of mischief happens and that was an extremely fun role to play that was like probably my favorite um but, and then i was um the mother in um 
Oh, Pride and Prejudice. I played um, the mom, and that was like extremely fun. Um, I love, I love that play. And Such then, serious roles, though. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, but, but both of them were very comedic. Like I was always like the comedic, um, you know, like uh, role. Um, and then I, oh gosh, my favorite musical I was in was Forty Second Street. Um, I love a good tap number. Um, you not a tap. I do. Yeah, I'm not extremely good at it. A lot of my friends were a lot better. I had some friends who went on to be in the Rockettes and wow. off Broadway and all this stuff. So um, compared to them, I was I, uh, maybe a little <laughs> shaky. But my six year old is in tap classes right now, Aww. and he That's he awesome. loves it. I think he loves the shoes more than the actual yeah. effort. But yeah, wearing shoes that make noise. Which I love tap. Doesn't love that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Tap is like the math of dance. I always tell people, like, if you want your kid to learn how to do, like, math, tap is really great because you're constantly focusing on the rhythm and the beats hmm. and the number of steps. It's a weird thing, but tap people would understand what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, and um, the role that I always wish I could play, easy. Um, my favorite musical is The Pajama Game. Um, and the movie version was in like the fifties and the, the lead, the lead girl in that, um, I think it was played by Doris Day. Yeah. Doris Day played her. And, um, I would absolutely, I would drop anything and, and audition for that show. If anyone around here did it, <laughs> you hear that MOVP, Actors yes. Guild. um, I'll tell you mine. Um, yes. at the same time that I was angel and rent. Oh my running gosh. around in drag <laughs> they were finishing up um and frank so i would be a nazi oh my gosh for like five minutes yeah. and then run upstairs to rehearsal and then put on my dance shoes amazing <laughs> in my nazi costume sometimes you know <laughs> uh, yeah that's and, awesome and my dream role that i never got and i'm unfortunately i've aged out of it is seymour I did get to be Brad and Rocky mm. Horror. That was my other dream role. But yeah, Seymour mm. in Little Shop. Yeah. You have to be like maybe 30. But I've definitely grayed, grayed out of... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be Mushnik. I don't, I don't want to get to, right. to the point where I'm Mushnik age. So. Oh, very um, cool. All right. So you sound like you're kind of an old soul. All the all of your picks seem like they were yeah. ancient plays. That <laughs> a lot I of know. Them, a lot of them. I, have not, we, I don't think we've had those around here. Right. Pajama Game, 1950s. So that kind of fits in perfectly with the People's Bank Theater being an ancient theater that yeah. was just recently revitalized. When I was a kid, it was the colony. Yeah. And it was haunted. And we would mm -hmm. go on tours down in the tunnel and the guy smoking cigar. And you could <laughs> smell the cool. smoke. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was it was an interesting tour. Yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about the People's Bank Theater now yeah. that it's fully up and running. You guys yep. have a, a great committee of people. You got volunteers. Yeah basically keep those lights on and yep. amazing yep. shows. And every year it seems like you guys are getting bigger and bigger acts. Tell me a little bit Festival. about the history of that theater. Yeah. So the, the name and the people who've owned the theater has changed a lot. So it, it all started back on uh, May 18th, 1911. Um, and it was a, it was a, just a vaudeville house. You know, when you think of like the old school comedy shows and like dance acts, burlesque too, that stuff happened there. Um, and then a fire happened in 1917, which, like, I don't know. What, there's so many buildings downtown that have been either impacted by fires or floods in this town. Um, but, yeah, that, that happened in 1917. Um, and an amusement company uh, immediately purchased it after that happened. Um, and then they vowed to, at once and more, allow it to make it to an elaborate scale. And on May 9th, 1919, the new Hippodrome Theater was opened to the public. Um, the first show at the Hippodrome uh, was Daddy Long Legs, starring Mary Pickford. Um, so, yeah, that was like the first non vaudeville show at the theater. Um, so, kind of, kind of interesting. Um, kind of fast forwarding through time here, a lot of things have happened. Um, opening night, um, eight years before the advent of talking pictures, the new Hippodrome offered vaudeville acts, Broadway plays, music concerts, magical acts, silent films accompanied by Hippodrome's own five piece orchestra. So that's kind of cool. You go see a movie and you'd have like, um, a little orchestra playing in the background, which I think would be really 
interesting. Do you know the difference between a uh, vaudevillian show and what they called a Nickelodeon? Was Nickelodeon movies, mm. like talking pictures with like an orchestra playing yep. the music? They, yes, I do. So yeah, yeah, the Nickelodeon was definitely like I think had to have film, like a silent film with an orchestra mm-hmm. playing the music. Okay, yeah, or even people okay. talking. I think over the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good question. I forgot about that term, Nickelodeon. Um, so yeah, so um, a lot of things happened since 1917. Um, in 1929, C&M Amusement Company installed a Vitaphone talking and synchronized moving pictures. And that was like a big thing back then. They put an air conditioning in the theater, which was like, ha, ah, huge. Like they would, that would be like outside of the marquee. Like we have AC, like come in here and cool down and watch a film um, or see a show. Um, and then the um the costs were getting i guess too much for this one um company to ha- take on so it switched ownership and then they had a contest to uh rename the theater and on june 25th 1949 the colony cinema opened to the public showing esther williams musical neptune's daughter never heard of that i don't know if you've heard of no, that. That, that was new to me as well yeah yeah so kind of cool and then um it, it, we kept they kept on bringing in awesome acts and shows some of the guests there included boris karloff count basie mammy smith who was kind of known to be uh, um african-american woman known to be like the start of blues the blues genre in America. It's pretty fascinating. We have some more in- information about Mammy Smith on our website. Just real, um, real quick. Yeah. Bor- Boris Karloff, the guy who played Frankenstein? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I-, I have a record that I have in my collection that I got out, out of a-, a big pick recently. It's Boris Kar- Karloff reading children's folk stories, I think it is. Amazing. Yeah. I- I'm never <laughs> selling it. I'm never selling it because who would have ever thought not only, you know, Frankenstein can talk, you know, yeah. but it's that guy reading children's folk stories from all over the around the world and things like that. So I'm going to research now what Boris Karloff did Yeah. here in Marietta. What was his performance like? Was he, was he like storytelling? Was right. he singing? I, who knows? Frankenstein may mm-hmm. be able to sing. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's a lot of things about the, the history of our theater. It's, it is very limited what we need to know. So we definitely rely a lot on our, our community and the people here. If you have any pictures or have any stories, um, about the theater, you know, or have family members who would pass down stories to you, like reach out to us. We'd love to hear it. Yes, please uh, reach mm-hmm. out to either people's bank theater, or you can email me and I'll get her the information at first city podcast at gmail com yeah that'd be really cool i would love to hear your stories so yeah i got all those awesome things and then one of the biggest things that actually happened at the theater it happened on february 12th 1957 and they had the hosting of the world premiere of a movie it was not in hollywood it was here in marriott ohio on the premiere of battle hymn um, where rock hudson portrayed um, a marietta native colonel dean hess and um, there's pictures of, of Front Street and Putnam absolutely being completely covered with people. They had a parade and Rock Hudson um, was in it. And so that was like one of the biggest things that's probably happened in Marietta history. I mean, aside from, the, you know, the, the, the pioneers settling here. It yeah. was pretty big. Do you have a photo of the Rock Hudson yeah. riding in the parade at the theater? Or yes, anything? You do? we do. I think we've shared them on, on our Facebook page before. Send it to me. I'd love to share it to the yeah. to our listeners on the Facebook page, the First City Podcast Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. we have pictures of him at the at the premiere outside the theater. Um, it's pretty cool. And it's really just cool to see those old, those old school photos and what the town looked like. And yeah, it's really neat. Really neat. Um, so yeah, fast forward on um, in the '60s, where you know we have a lot of more um, movies happening at the theater, um, and from '75 to '89, the colony changed hands several times. And in March of 1980, a failed boiler threatened to close the colony, but um, a lady named Marjorie B became the first local owner of the theater, and she she bought it and and saved it. Um, and that happened in 1981. But unfortunately, things got a little ca- um, pricey, and it was forced to close um, in December of 1985, um, which is just so sad to think about that theater being empty and just sitting there. And um, it's, it's out there until 
the the revitalization started, yeah. right? And when, yep. when, when, when did that happen? I remember mm-hmm. maybe early 2000s, was it? So so it was purchased by Dan Steffen Sr. in 1989 in the hopes that one day they can open it up again. And then thanks to People's Bank, our namesake, and a bunch of other you know, um, you know people working to, to fundraise and secure um, grants and, and donations, it officially opened in 2016. I think it took... I mean, it was in the works for, gosh, several decades. I mean, 20 years maybe. Um, I'm, not, I'm definitely not the person really to, to give too much detail on that. I mean, I remember yeah. in high school when we would take those tours, the tours were helping fund the revitalization. That okay. was around that time frame. 2002 is when I graduated. Mm-hmm. And I think it was around that time frame. Um, might be asking Todd Burge that question next time I talk to him. Yeah. And uh, I remember the seats and everything were, were still, everything was still in there. Um, everything cool. was just covered in dust mm. and spider webs. And it definitely had that creepy, eerie feeling oh, that yeah. you want on a haunted tour, of course. Yeah. But um, to see where it is now, it's just insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's super, super cool. So 2016, they opened up the doors and, and we have been rocking ever since. I'm, and, and yeah, our mission is was to preserve and rebuild the theater how it was, you know, originally um, in order to, of course, just to keep that classic historical look, but also to, and to secure that we could continue to get funding, you know, through historical preservation um, grants and stuff like that. So that's why our seats are a little bit small. That's like one of our biggest, you know, maybe... Um, I don't know if they're complaints, but just like reviews that we'll get is like awesome show. Loved it. Like no, not a bad seat in the house, but sometimes the seats can be a little smaller if you go if really tall. Um, just because back in the day, that's how they were. They're tight knit little little seats. But I've been to several shows where no one is sitting. You know, yeah. everyone's up on their feet. You know, and having a good time. So, but yeah, I mean, so since then, since 2016. Um, been bringing in all kinds of different things. Rock, country are our biggest thing, of course. That's our big money makers. But you know, next week we're going to have body traffic in, and they're a dance group, contemporary dance group. And that's part of the um, Esben Shade series, correct? Uh, can, can you tell me a little bit about who this Esben Shade person is? I'm, I'm not familiar with with that so, and how that came to be. That it's basically free to the community to go. All you have to do is uh, is request tickets. Yeah, it is free. We, so the tickets open up, I think, two weeks before each Esben Shades show. So keep an eye on our website and our Facebook and our email for all of that. Um, but yeah, it's through Marietta College. And it's it's, it's a series pre- presented by Marietta College. And do, 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 let me see here. It's funded by the Frederica G. Esben Shade Memorial Fund. Um, and that's pretty much all I really know about it. <clears throat> people, at, other people at the theater might have some more insight, but it's awesome that we can, this, this fund allows us to bring in diverse acts, um, things that we normally wouldn't be, be having, you know, dance groups. Mm-hmm. We'll have a pianist, a classical pianist come in. But yeah. So it's really cool that we're able to do that. Um, that's just one of the shows we have, you know, in February, we're going to have uh, 38 special, Sarah Evans, um, and those, I mean, not 38 special, like not a tribute, like the actual 38 special. So it's just really cool that we're able to get these big, you know, bands in. Um, and we had Sticks, and you know, in this past October, which yeah. was huge. I, still, I mean, I, huge. Uh, Sticks uh, had, had some of their members in the store. Yes. So oh. the, re- the how we ended up with all this autograph merch is, uh, they they came in and they wanted all these records. They didn't want to spend money. <laughs> they didn't want to spend money so they were like can we do a trade and i'm like you take you know go back to the bus let's get everybody to sign a couple records give me you know some, yeah. some sticks for sticks yes. uh, so we got some drumsticks autograph eight by tens autographed albums some yeah. t- press passes um some other tchotchkes and we called it we called it even I would have done it just because Stick was in my store. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So who was here? Was Tommy Shaw in I here? was home with my kids. I wasn't oh. in the store. I was so mad when <laughs> when, when my helper uh, called me and was like, somebody from Sticks is in the store. I don't I don't even know who it was. He didn't okay. know. Yeah. And uh, I, obviously you're not going to ask, which member are you? <laughs> so, right. Like, who are you? Yeah. So basically oh, they, they, made, they made it happen for the store, and it was a sad day for me. Right. <laughs> I know that for a fact. Uh, yeah, Sticks is like 
Styx is my all time favorite <laughs> band, like rock band. I've seen them several times and they're still putting out music. I mean, they just released an album, I think, in the, called the Cl- Crash of the Clown or not Crash of the Clown, uh, Crash of the Crown, maybe in 2021 anyways it's awesome um and they still perform amazing and sound amazing it's just cool to bring those guys into our theater because you know we have just under a thousand seats so no matter where you're sitting it's going to be you're going to have a fantastic view um whether you're in the balcony or our our uh, auditorium is sloped so even if you're in the back you can still see just fine um because it's like a sloped upward um you know auditorium um, but yeah, I mean, we've had, yeah, just really, I know we've had Chicago in there before, um, and 38 special will be another really big one. We're working on bringing in some more really big country acts again, too. Like I said, those are just our big, our, our fans, our, our patrons really love classic rock country. So it, yeah, it's really awesome what we can, we can bring in. And we just had Chris Jansen earlier this month. Yeah. Killed it. I mean, he celebrated his fifth number one song um while we were while he was performing there like that day so it was really cool to be there and witness that and yeah history is continuing to be made at the people's bank theater <laughs> i'm really excited for uriah heap oh gosh yeah Uriah heap saxon is there a third actor or is it just uriah heap and saxon yeah uriah heap and saxon wow. yeah i mean that, that that's kind of a big deal for any any classic rock fan we have a lot of uriah heap albums here in the store i spend them all the time mostly because the album covers they had such iconic yep. artwork on their albums i love their album the art yeah the, the artwork on the albums are awesome so i'm going to look up here really quick when they're coming because yes we announced them a while back here and they are coming on thursday may 16th 8 p.m i know that we've had people from all over the place like calling us messaging us saying like i'm coming up from south carolina can't wait to see these guys this is a very this is a different it's rock but it's a different niche of rock music for us a little more heavier a little more like it's you know like the british rock metal a little bit um so it'll be interesting i'm really excited for it (laughs) absolutely and uh the the very next show coming up what, what what is the next show that people can go see yeah so that would be the esben shade body traffic show and that is wednesday next week which is february 21st the day after that we got 38 special on the 22nd 8 p.m most shows start at 8 p.m right after 38 special that friday next friday is sarah evans and so that's going to be a busy week for us wednesday thursday friday boom 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 <laughs> <laughs> and you guys run basically off of volunteers to help people to their seats to do the concessions and things yeah. like that. Yep. It's an amazing thing. And um, hope to have you back in the studio. Uh, yeah. We'll probably have you back monthly to talk about what's coming up next or any big news. And if you have any in, in uh, uh, information on uh, Ms. Esben Shade, if you're an Esben Shade fanboy, please reach out to me. I would love to know a little bit about her and her history and why uh, – this series, uh, you know, in Marietta College happens. I, I think it's I think it's awesome. I just like to kind of know a little bit more. So, Caitlin, thank you very much for joining us. We will see you again probably uh, in a few weeks, and we'll Sounds talk good. about what's coming up next. All right, have a great one. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Miss Caitlin Streeter. I never thought in a million years that I would ever say Esmond Shade fanboy in my life. But uh, if you guys do have any information on uh, Ms. Esmond Shade and her love of local theater and why they are, there is a connection between the college and People's Bank Theater, feel free to shoot me an email. The email address is firstcitypodcaster at gmail.com. Now, real quick, before we get into the interview with Mr. Tony Workman, we're going to discuss a little bit about the things coming up in the store over the next few weeks. Coming up this Friday night, we have Jake Dunn and Nick Dittmeyer doing a live acoustic set in the store. Jake Dunn, as you know, is a local guy from Jake Dunn and the Blackbirds, one of my personal favorite alt-country, outlaw country bands. We had them in the store for first Friday last month, and they rocked the house. We had a packed house, and it was absolutely amazing. I wanted to make sure that I got him back in. 
and he's bringing in his buddy Nick Dittmeyer of the band Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters. He is out on tour right now, and he had a night off between now and a show in Cincinnati, so he's going to sit in and do an acoustic show with uh, Jake Dunn. It's going to be completely unique. You're never going to get to see this type of show again, and they're going to you know trade stories. They're going to trade songs. They're going to talk about you know stuff, and they're going to do an entire acoustic set trading off songs. It's going to be a completely unique experience. We don't do a lot of live music so far uh, outside of First Fridays, so make sure to come and support the store and come and support your local music. And um, what we have offered is you can come to the show for free or you can donate 20 bucks, and I'll give you a chair, some, uh, some free drinks, and some free snacks. That way you guys uh, can come in and enjoy the store, enjoy the show, and know that you're not only supporting live music, but uh, small business as well. Uh, coming up on 419, Taylor Swift's uh, Taylor's Tortured Poets Party. We have exclusive shirts up for pre-order at firstcityrecordstore.com. If you're coming to that show, um, you can. Uh, it's for free. We're going to have all kinds of fun things, including we're giving away a Taylor Swift autograph record. We have trivia. We have... Uh, bead making we have uh, karaoke and uh, just meet and greet all of the other Taylor Swift fans in town the last time that we did this for the 1989 party it was a massive success we had 50 60 people in the store coming and for that so come and pick up her brand new album have a great time chance winning an autographed album and um I've talked to my friend Rebecca, who is the Taylor Swift cosplayer that we have, and I think we're going to go with like a semi-formal formal black and white attire theme thing because we're going to be decorating the stores. We're going all out for this. It's going to be super fun. Follow the Facebook page, First City Records on, on Facebook, and make sure also to follow First City Records, uh, the event page for the Taylor Swift thing. That's where we're going to have all the updates, including the link to pre-order that shirt. If you're coming to the show and, and or if you're coming to the event and you want to pre-order a shirt to, to pick up at the event, they're locally made, so you're, not, you're helping multiple local businesses. It's going to be a really great time. Hope to have you. And uh, the very next day is Record Store Day, so I'm going to be super tired after two nights of uh, very big parties. Uh, so Record Store Day is coming. The list is live. we got about two weeks of uh, putting in your special requests. So if you make a request from me to get an album for Record Store Day, all I ask is that you shop at First City Records on Record Store Day so I don't get stuck with a crate worth of stuff because I have to pay for these things up front. And it would be great that if uh, you request something that you come Stand in line, be part of the event. It's going to be a great day. I've got uh, some plans that I'm going to announce later for Record Store Day, and we're trying to nail down a very special guest for next week's episode to talk about the Record Store Day list. And um, it's uh, Elmer Grelly from The Sound Exchange, the place where I bought my very first album when I was a kid. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about talking shop we're going to talk about record uh, running record stores because he basically runs his as well i'm um, hoping to pull uh, to, to kind of pin that one down we're going to call it the record store round table and we're going to hopefully do an a la uh, high fidelity top five list of the things on record store day we're most excited for I'm looking forward to sitting down with Elmer. It's been a while since we've kind of touched base on what uh, what's going on in his life. I'm looking very much forward to that. So I'm hoping we can pin that down for this coming week and not for the following week. So be on the lookout. Watch the podcast Facebook page, First City Podcast on Facebook, and uh, I'll let you know as soon as I know for sure. So let's jump right into my interview with Mr. Tony Workman. You know him as the owner of Classic Plastics. There's a lot of drama uh, going on around, uh, you know, what happened to his store at the mall, what happened to a store in Canton. Um, I want to give him a platform and as much time as I possibly could to not only get to know him on a more personal level, because we've been friends for a long time, but I don't know a lot about him on the back end, as we would say. Uh, I wanted to sit down, talk shop a little bit, get to know him a little bit better, and then we dived right into the meat and potatoes, the drama, and uh, we talked a little bit about mental health, and I wanted to make sure he was doing okay because, my goodness, it's been a, a weird couple months for him, and I feel for him big time. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. This is where I will leave you. I'll see you on the outro and enjoy my interview with Tony Workman. All right, guys, we're back, and uh, we have our first guest in the studio today. It's Tony Workman, owner of the Classic Plastics Toy Show. Expo, 
and the store, which is now located at the Rinks in uh, Marietta. So welcome in. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're my first guest, so we're awesome. going to see how this goes, all right? <laughs> Try to take it easy. we got some cold brews here, and uh, hopefully this goes well, so we'll see how it happens. We've known each other for a lot. I don't even know how many years now. Several years? Yeah. I started it. coming into your shop when you were back down on Market Street. Okay. So Was that your first location uh, after Rinks? Yeah, first physical. Yeah. So that's What happened down there? Uh, the sales were just weren't there. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the main thing that I heard from people was that uh, they didn't want to pay for parking. Uh, there is yeah. free parking down there, but you have to be willing to walk is the thing. So it's a parking was definitely an issue. I, re I remember that um, I deal with the same thing up on Front Street. Yeah. You don't have to pay to park, but there's like a two hour limit. Good luck finding a spot on some days sometimes. So I can see that that is kind of a hassle. But uh, yeah. had a good time taking our kids there. Uh, you know, they played uh, 1942. We'd always go through the old McDonald's toys yeah. and the wrestling toys. When my oldest son was younger, we'd, oh, we couldn't leave without getting a, a wrestling toy and all that. <laughs> so when did, uh, when did Classic Plastics become an idea before it became a store? Um, well, it's, I've been open for a decade, so it's been over, uh, over a decade. I was working at REM. Uh, it's uh, in-home care. And uh, I was doing like garage sales and just collecting on my own and it just it, it got out of hand i had totes and totes and totes full of stuff that i was just kind of picking up because it was cheap some of it mm -hmm. i was keeping but i uh it just went from there i was, I was working this job that just felt miserable i hated it uh were you working direct care then yeah yeah, yeah. i was yeah. working in, a, in an individual's home and yeah. he was uh pretty aggressive a lot of the time so like i still it's been years and i still kind of have nightmares about it so it's, yeah uh, it, it's, it's i spent about 10 years working direct care <laughs> and i'm not gonna say where i worked but i was hit in the face with a two by four i was bit pulled my car got pulled off the side of the road wow. by an individual grabbed the wheel yeah. i had one almost die on me he had a peanut allergy that i they never told me about wow. and uh yeah yeah it takes a special person to want to be able to do that really so yeah. i can see why you'd want to change and uh, go into business for yourself how did that happen? Like, how did you finally decide to pull the trigger? Uh, well, I had been trying to talk my uh, friend into going in with me for the longest time, and he was just kind of dragging his feet. And I got to the point to where I was just fed up, and I went into my friend's house, and I told his roommate, I was like, I'm starting it with, it, with or without him. Yeah. And so uh, it came time to go to... I decided to start at Ringy Dinks, just kind of bootstrapping it. I had like thirty, literally thirty dollars in my pocket, and whatever toys that I was going to take and donate to the store originally, and uh, and I decided to open it the weekend of the ratio. Oh, so, so I was very, very mad when I was like, "All right, here's the first weekend, I'm open," and then everywhere lost power for the entire weekend. So I didn't yeah. officially open until the weekend uh, after that was my first official. This, I'm doing this and I still I stayed with rim for probably another two or three years and I did that Monday through Thursday and then rinks Friday through Sunday so I remember the derecho uh, I was appraising a house when it first started and uh, <laughs> and then we were in the process of moving from a, an apartment to a house in Upper Vienna and trying to get a u-haul when there's no electric for a week uh, and I also had to DJ a wedding during the week there was no electric and we ran off of three car batteries uh, until there was no gas left and there was like a generator that ran out of gas and uh then and at that point the party was over it was at the the belpre shriners club it was like 150 degrees in there nobody was wanting to dance everybody just wanted to drink and get get the hell out of there. Yeah. yeah that was that would have been a crazy time to try to open a business yeah um okay so you're you're up at ranks i remember taking my kids up there we didn't know each other at the time but we bought Pokemon cards, again, wrestlers. Um, I was always into VHS. I still collect uh, VHS, mostly horror stuff. But yeah. um, so how long were you at Rinks before you decided to try something else? And when you decided to, to, to find another place, when did you decide on going to the mall? Oh, uh, well, the uh, Rinks was, I was probably there for three years. And then I decided to go. Oh, yeah, down the Market Street. Down, yeah, downtown. Okay. So I did that. I was, I was there for almost three years it was it was two or three it's i can't remember now everything just blends together at this point um but then things just weren't they weren't going very well downtown i was trying uh 
different things that just wasn't panning out. And I and just one day the mall had their uh, local lease person just walk in and be like, hey, this is a cool place. Have you ever thought about going to the mall? And then my refer- first response was, well, I've heard it's pretty expensive. And yeah. he was like, well, not really. Let's talk. And we talked. And the price actually, compared to what I was paying, wasn't that much more. Uh, and it came with a huge build-in traffic. So I was like, oh, absolutely, right, yeah. let's do it. So uh, I just then I decided to move. I moved within like, I think I, my, my, my lease was almost over at that point too. So, so you just jumped in head first. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow. Okay. Now, when we're talking about uh, the mall, I, I, I reached out to them recently before I moved to my new location. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about if you reach a certain dollar amount, then you start having to pay them <laughs> like a 10% royalty on your profits. Right. And rent goes up from no- November and December. And right. it just got too complicated for me to even wrap my head around thinking thinking about it. Did, did they present it to you that way? Or was this, uh-huh. a compl- I think it was a different owner. When you first moved in. Yeah, I think we're on the third owner now. Uh, and that lease person stayed working with the mall for like a month and then went back to Coca-Cola. Oh. Uh, so he brought me in and then ditched me. And then the new person came in. And yeah, uh, they definitely up front did not tell me the overages and all the extra stuff that I was going to have to pay. Um, so that, that was definitely a surprise. And uh, I don't... It's no surprise small businesses don't do very well under that kind of uh, regimen. Like that, just how do you? I was paying, so I was paying two thousand for my space. Well, at the time, I think it was fifteen hundred for the original. But this last, this where I was, where it ended, was two thousand, and anything over twenty thousand, they got ten percent of every penny after that. Uh, so if you make over twenty thousand in a month, then they get ten percent over that, and then um, so. October, November, December, which is the high traffic month. That's Christmas. You know, it's toys they sell at Christmas. So I was, uh, well, originally changed this. So originally it was those three months were higher rent. So I was paying double. So I was paying 4000 a month per month for those three months. And then they got the overages went up. But I, December, I was still hitting this because it was great. It's Christmas. You yeah. know, I'm in the mall, I'm making lots of money. So, But then they took a, a good chunk of that for doing nothing. Um, so that, that wasn't very great. Um, and it did not get any better. (laughs) Definitely doesn't seem like their business model is set up for the small guy. It's definitely set up for chains. And honestly, as a person who's lived in Parkersburg and Vienna my entire life, I can say this, that it scared me too much to start a business in Parkersburg and Vienna because of all the chains and, and seeing all the mom and pops and the small guys last and then fall away. And I thought if I had a chance of surviving at all, it would be in Marietta where people seem a little bit more attuned to um, supporting the local economy because there's more of it. And it's like Front Street. I don't think there's anything chain related on Front Street. Nothing I can think of. And that was the that was the uh, thing about downtown on Market Street is that the whole goal of downtown PKV and when I was down there is we were trying to draw more business, yeah. but it ended up just being restaurants and office spaces, and there just wasn't any more retail that was following me down there to help build. They want, they really do want downtown to succeed, but I was the only retail place to have gone down there, and I think there might there might be one or two down there now. But I think you'd do better if you were down there now than than back in the back in the day. Yeah, it was just you guys down there, and then the the wine bar came in, and right. that was nice. You know, be able to get a cup of coffee and then go shop for toys or whatever. Um, I can definitely see the revitalization on, on Market Street, um, but again, I don't really see any retail. It's mostly re- well, restaurants and bars and nightlife, exactly. and yeah. I think that's great. Uh, I, I'm 40. I don't go out after dark, <laughs> so it's not for me. But uh, it's nice to see that it's happening in the Discovery yeah. Zone, coolest place in town. I like that place a lot. Have you ever been down in there? Not yet. No, I've seen yeah. a lot of people mention it. My kids are awesome. obsessed. We go almost every weekend. So <laughs> awesome. it's a really cool place. Um, so anyways, we're going to dive into what happened with the mall later on in this interview. But um, I don't want to spend the entire time complaining about uh, the mall. So let's talk about some other things. we got the Classic Plastics Toy Show Expo coming up in just a few weeks here, March 2nd and 3rd, as always, at the Parkersburg Art Center on Market Street, downtown Parkersburg. Um, how many are, how many, this is what, the sixth show, seventh show? This is the 
eighth or ninth. I can't remember ninth. which one. Yeah. Okay, and so the last show was okay. We did okay, yeah. and then you immediately made the announcement that this may be or this is the last one coming up. Yeah. Are you talking September? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was was that based on an emotional response or is that I am done with the stress of putting on this event? I'm going to do it one more time for my people and that's it. Uh, it's a definite mix of both. Uh, the being downsized and everything, all the financial, it's financially and my, uh, all my employees are, have gone on to somewhere else. So it's just kind of me and one other employee and it's just gotten too much to be able to continue. Okay. Well, I think I've been a part of, three or four of the eight or nine and yeah. i've always not only done well but it's always a blast i always like to see the vendors and my and i consider some of them friends now um and of course i always like to buy some stuff that i don't need <laughs> i'm always a fan of buying stuff i don't need i will be a vendor at the the final show is it still considered the final show it is yeah uh I, becky is the one i put her in charge of running it because it's it's gotten a lot, a lot over the years for me to, mm -hmm. to handle with that and the store. I had another location that I was doing too. So uh, she's been in charge of it for the last two or three shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mentioned to her, I was like, if people want to come out in droves, I've been posting, like if you come out in droves, show us, show your support. I mean, if we're, if we're getting going to get three, three to 4,000 people through the door, that's another thing. But uh, numbers wise, uh, the way that it has been, it is not financially feasible for me. As a person who also does their small business, basically, and feels like a by yourself, like the weight of the world is on my shoulders every day yeah. to buy the next collection. How am I going to get people in the door? What am I going to What am I going to do for marketing today? Um, I, I can imagine on a, such a grand scale, putting on something like that has to be a massive undertaking. Trying to get that many people in one place and do it and make make money yeah. at it yeah. and not only make money but also get your name out there so people will support you your all year long yeah. and september was definitely a, a different one because it was our first show outside of march it's always been in the f very first weekend of march so mm -hmm. the september show was a second add-on that we were hoping that was it, and this was all before everything with the mall and the closing of the stores so we were all we were looking forward to growing even more and doing a twice a year and we chose september because every everything else around we wanted a fall show but we wouldn't we didn't we couldn't go up against halloween so any of october was out um so um so we decided to, to go with september and the i guess i don't know if it was just people didn't realize that it was happening again or what but the number the numbers were very down and, and that it's not a surprise like i said it was the first time trying something different uh, so we weren't sure how it was going to go. But even if uh, the la the previous one was in March, just based off of the March numbers, I, d I don't think that it, there just isn't enough turnout to be able to. Uh, it takes three to six months planning and getting all this together. This for this upcoming March, we just the day or two ago, uh, we had three people cancel. So luckily we had um, a backup list that we were able to fill those tables. But like, it, it's very po at any at any point more people could cancel and then we just don't have more spaces so it's the, yeah it's de it's the stress it'll be nice if it's not the very last forever it's definitely at the very last for a while so i can take some time understood um <laughs> jimmy avocados are they going to be in the house as usual yeah he is unsure if he's going to be out in the truck out front or if he's going to be up on the top floor in the kitchen uh he is going to work on hoping to do the truck out front it just makes it easier on everybody Mm -hmm. I got to say, they're my favorite food truck in town and Jimmy's social media. If you're not following Jimmy Avocado on Facebook, you need to, you need to do it. He's a, he's a character and he's a really great guy and he's supported my store. He's came and, uh, and set up things and a few different times that he's had to cancel last minute for one reason or the other. He's always found a replacement for me and he's just a brilliant guy to, to have on your side and, uh, I, I definitely hope to eat some more of his best tacos. Yeah, definitely. I love the that show. His, he's very uh, community oriented. He started doing yeah. the Taco Tuesdays or free free for kid free Taco Tuesday for kids. 
Uh, I, I think I, I assume it comes with a purchase that your yeah. child can eat for free, but that that's pretty cool. Not a lot of places do that. Yeah, and I'm stoked that he has a physical location now too. Yes, he is the also. former Mamma Mia Pizza. Uh, something. Make a Mia, yep. Make a Mia Pizza yeah. down on the the bottom of Market Street. Yep. So definitely go and show uh, the physical location of Jimmy Avocado some love if you're downtown. I think it's near the um, the, the big gas station. What is that? Uh, Sheets. Yeah, the Sheets. Yeah, the parking lots are connected, so you can just park at Sheets if you want to. All right, let's change gears here a little bit. And I have a, a question here from an audience member. Oh, okay. <laughs> they want to know, um, since you are a toy collector that you must have a massive personal collection or maybe in the past have had a massive personal collection what do you collect what are your favorite things to collect in your collection and what is the most expensive item in your collection so let's start with the first question uh what do you collect the most of uh mini figures uh that's like muscle men monster in my pocket uh just anything like an inch or smaller, just small. Uh, I have thousands of them, and they take very little space. Do you collect so, Z-Bots? I do. I have a. That's something that uh, I'm. I've been recently having to unload some of my collection, and that is going to be one of the last if I can let them go. If you decide that you don't want to let them go, I have several left oh. over from a massive collection that I had of Z-Bots. Awesome. But I also adore Muscle Men, and when I think of minifigures. Um, I immediately go to the monsters in my pocket. Yeah. Um, I collected those as a kid. I had no idea as a kid that they had variants and, and things like that. And there's right. chases. I mean, the, 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 that whole world doesn't exist really. When we were kids, we just collected them to collect them. Right. And uh, now there's like people hunting these variants. Yep. Some when it was like, for a lot. I thought it was just yellow, you know, <laughs> I didn't know that it was that important. What's your favorite piece in your collection that you're never going to get part with? I have some stuff from my childhood that don't have a whole lot left. It is a uh, uh, Ultimate Warrior uh, Pillow Buddy. I think that's what they Pillow Buddy or Smash Buddy or whatever they were called. Yeah, I think they were Smash um, Buddies. Yeah, I have I have uh, Ultimate Warrior, and then I have my little brother's uh, Hulk Hogan. See, w when we were younger, we had the Ultimate Warrior, Hogan, Jake the Snake, and I think the Macho Man. My brother p cut, colored the Macho Man's nose purple <laughs> to match his tights. <laughs> made me so mad i would love to have those things back again and they're making those again they too are. of modern wrestlers and uh like they're selling them at conventions and whatnot have you seen the horror ones no they're doing like leatherface in the same style so I th uh, i'm not sure somebody online has them i'm not sure who <laughs> all right and um what is your probably your most expensive piece in your collection your the one that if you were to show off your collection to somebody who says coming to your house for a podcast would you show them and be like this is the um, the holy grail of the collection. Uh, well, I recently sold that, uh, so I would say any of my Mad Balls. Now I, I have a pretty decent sized collection of Mad Balls, but the the one that I had sold was a. Uh, are you familiar with um, uh, Loyal Subjects? No, it's a vinyl articulated vinyl uh, figure company. They make like I think they're three inch or four inch figures, and it was a Dragon Ball Z Goku. But what they do with every line that they do, they do Thundercats, G.I. Joe, a whole bunch of different lines. And they'll have 28 figures that are like, they're the same figure, but they're painted so they get, they're a variant or a chase. And they're called Club 28. And there's only 28 that were made and will only ever be made. Uh, so I sold that along with the regular version of that same Goku figure. And it went for almost 400. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't expect that amount, so. Okay, and do you remember uh, a couple of years ago you sold me that My Pet Monster? Yeah. That My Pet Monster is literally how my store was born. Oh, nice. Because that was my best friend and my buddy growing up, three years old. That was like literally, it, it was with me everywhere. It was my Linus blanket, yeah. if you will. It went everywhere with me. And then just getting that piece back, like brought back so much nostalgia and so much love for things that i used to have because we had a house fire and i lost everything from my childhood oh, wow. so coming to your store was more of a cathartic experience than it was a shopping trip yeah. it was seeing and replacing certain items that i thought i would never see again that's awesome what piece from your childhood were you able to get that brought back the best memories 
I'd probably say micro machines. I was just going through those the other night, just like looking at them, and I'd forgot how some of them had doors that opened or the hoods that opened, or they they had like attachments you could put on top of them to make them into monster <laughs> cars and all kinds of. They had uh, micro mini micro machines, which are super tiny. I have a I handful those. of those. Uh, so yeah, it's really nostalgic on that. I remember the commercials with the guy that could talk so crazy fast. <laughs> yeah. And he was like on an episode of Save by the Bell as like a substitute teacher or something. It was <laughs> it's like, hey, that's the guy from the from the micro machines commercials. <laughs> Do you remember the Hot Wheels um the garage playset from the eighties? Yeah. It was like that tan and brown monstrosity and it had like the little gas pump you could pump your gas with. Yeah. I saw somebody post that on Facebook, and it brought it brought back the same kind of feelings. Yeah. Um, kind of pivoting off of that question, um, do you prefer selling the modern toys, or do you like selling and collecting and buying collections of the vintage toys more? Uh, vintage, for sure. The The mall had me branch out, or they didn't, but me being at the mall had me try to branch out to do more of the newer stuff and to help since I already had a pretty solid, solid focus on vintage. So I just, I wanted to expand it. And so the modern was the best way to go. Um, but with, uh, and, and I think that's a question that you're going to ask later about the toy market in general, that like the prices are just getting insane. And it was very, yeah. it was really difficult to keep up with how much they were turning out and how much more they were than before COVID. See, I, I noticed that I wanted to support the store way more than I could f- feasibly do with four kids yeah. and you know trying to run my own small business just seeing ooh, it's karate kid my favorite thing in the world i collect everything karate kid but everything was 30 40 50 dollars for 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 an action figure and some of them weren't painted the, the greatest right cross-eyed <laughs> you know what what have you so you, you know you sometimes you had to pick and choose um which ones you could get and which ones which companies uh, for one a lot of people would say hold their value better in case there was a rainy day and you have to sell them, I guess. Yeah. Um, Funko Pops is something I'll never understand. <laughs> I don't know why people collect them and, and go crazy the way that they do. I have a few. Yeah, it's usually things that are like emotionally attached to me, like let's say Brad from Rocky Horror, because um, I played Brad, Brad and Rocky Horror at the Actors Guild and... Maybe just a few musicians. Um, if they ever make a John Candy one, I would definitely get that. Oh, definitely. Because um, he was like my first celebrity. Like, he was my dad. Like, I watched John Candy every day. I remember the day he died. I remember my mom coming to the bottom of the stairs and screaming up to the top of the stairs that John Candy had just passed away. You shouldn't remember that at 12 years old. Yeah. He was the first death in my life that really, like, you know, did something to me. Do you collect Funko Pops? And if so, what which ones do you have? Because you sell a lot of them. Do you have yeah. any yourself? Uh, I did, and then I realized how much of a problem it was going to turn into. Uh, they they really do. They get out of hand because they and, it, and the part of the reason why they sell so well is because like you you are getting specific ones of things that you liked, and that's that's what it is. They make so much that it doesn't matter if you like DC or you like Marvel or whatever they're bound to have already made a Funko Pop of something that you want. So if it's, especially if it's something they don't make a lot of action figures or anything of period, I'm sure Funko's made it. And so people want to be able to put that on their, on their desk. Uh, and talking about John Candy and Funko, I'm really surprised that they haven't done him yet. That's yeah. They, they, I mean, they could do a whole series on his movies. My uh, goodness. From uh, who's Harry Crumb and, and dressing up in that big drag outfit that he wore <laughs> camp candy. Yeah. Do you remember camp candy? I the do. cartoon yeah. that, that show should have lived on. I, why is that not on DVD going on a tangent there <laughs> to kind of bring it back, uh, back around. Okay. So one thing I noticed as a business owner, when I tried to get into some of the toys is you can't just buy, two or three for your shop they are like you have to buy the entire series run you have to spend x amount of dollars and you have to place another order by x date to stay a member of our elite society of toys as a record store owner i can buy taylor swift has a new record coming out i want 10 um deftones have a new record 10 um hollow notes have a new record one get one and i can buy one and nobody bats an eye how in the world can a toy store function by having to buy cases upon cases of the exact same thing without knowing if the market's going to want that? Like how much backstock do you get stuck with and how do you alleviate that backstock? 
uh, a lot of back stock actually. And the thing that helped the most with that is uh, that I had two stores that uh, my brother ran the one in Canton. So a lot of the time, if it was something that we knew we were kind of iffy on, we'd just order it for one, for one store. And then when I was getting ready to go up there uh, to do it, we did inventory swaps a lot. So it was just, uh, I'd set half of the case aside and take the other half to him. Uh, so most of the co- companies that I ordered from, they'd make me do a minimum of six. Uh, so it was, in our minds, it was really easy just to get rid of three and three. Uh, and for the most part, it was. I mean, I, we definitely have some duds. There's surprisingly, NECA had a Jaws Hooper figure that just, this lot, we were at a show this past weekend and we were selling them for like five, ten bucks. Just, uh, I've never sold a NECA, it hurt. I've never sold a NECA figure that, that cheap before. I don't know what it is about that figure. It's it's a good figure. If you like Jaws, you should want that. But man. Now, was Hooper Richard Dreyfus or was he the, 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 the shark captain? Uh, Dreyfus. Uh, Dreyfus, okay. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies, but I can I can see a Richard Dreyfus action figure not selling well. Yeah. I don't I don't know. There's certain records that I buy that, and I bought like the brand new Greta Fleet album. I bought like 20 copies of that record, and I still have 10 wow. or so. And every time somebody comes to the store asking for a donation for whatever, <laughs> that's the record I go back to the closet and like here take one of these. <laughs> yes, it's a thirty dollar record, but at this point I just have so much back stock. It's just nice to be like that's my write off for the month. You know, yeah, I did that a lot with Funko. All right, and on that, we're going to take a short little commercial break, and when we get back with Tony, we have a lot more questions, including, like, his love of plants and animals, as well as we're going to talk about the mall and uh, what happened with the classic plastics at the mall and the dreams for the future. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. And we got Tony Workman still in the studio. We're going to be moving on to a couple different topics. But first, let's talk about your love of plants and animals. Um, We've been friends on social media for several years now, and it seems like you tend to post more about composting, flowers, your pets, your love of animals, uh, self-sustainability. You post about things like that more than you even do about toys or your business a lot of the time, especially in the summer. Yeah. What is that? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of an escape for me. Uh, I mean, the, my my business and what I do most of the time has to revolve around toys. So if I do post about toys, it'll be something that I, I personally like in a line, and that'll be from my personal page. But a lot of the time I just keep the toys to my business page so if i or in my in my toy club uh, group on facebook and kind of separate it and still kind of have kind of a a life outside of the store um plants and animals are something i'm super passionate about possibly even more so than toys um i've i I can remember the very first time my dad took me out to, to his flower beds and lifted over a rock and saw a worm under it and was like hey look at this worm and i was just like i was stuck from then on i was like there's stuff under rocks and so yeah i'm super big into gardening a lot of it is is a self-sustainable kind of a thing like the older i've got the more i've wanted to grow my own kind of food uh save it you know prepare for things like we were talking about the storm that knocked out power for the weekend like it would have been nice to not have my wife and i we didn't have air conditioning and we didn't have food so we went to cracker barrel and we ate and charged our phones for a couple hours and stayed in the air conditioning during that. So like, yeah, if we had had food here, cause all of it went bad in the freezer or whatever. Um, so it's, it's, uh, that's also part of like being a business owner. You want to, you want to provide for yourself and your, for your family. And so a lot of the gardening, like, especially in the growing months of crop season, I try, we try to grow a lot of our own food to feed ourselves. Um, so it's, it's kind of, and it's a, it's a immediate, it's not an immediate return return. It's a definite return when you when you can go outside and you can pick something out of your garden. You can come inside and you can cook it right in your kitchen. Something that you planted and yeah. nourished and took care of. Yeah, it's like a baby. Yeah, that you grow and then you get to eat. Yeah, <laughs> right. And it's something that people can't take away from me. Whereas the the toy store, you know, I I work hard. I sell those toys. I make some money, and then the government, and then the place where I rent from, and my insurance, and all of these other places take. So I, so I make $100, and I'm probably netting 10 15 20 if I'm lucky on a good day. 
um, it, it's it's a lot. So it's nice yeah. to be able to step back and just kind of actually be in. It puts me in reality too. Like uh, I'm, I deal with people on a regular basis. Sometimes I just need to sit down with my dog or my chickens or just kind of watch them do their thing and not have a care in the world. They're just they're just sitting there like scratching out of the ground. You know, it's it's really relaxing. Sometimes I wish I was an animal. <laughs> I look at my dog and watching their licking himself and yeah. scratching himself. And I was like, man, you're just wasted space, but you're living your best life. Best life. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about wanting to provide for your family. Maybe, most people may may not know that you are married. Yeah. Uh, she seems to be a very private person. She, she's rarely ever seen or talked about, yeah. but she exists. And she sure. actually <laughs> is the person who takes care of my baby at the daycare. Yeah. I did not know this until my wife told me. That's how I knew where you lived. Okay. My wife was like, that's Tony's <laughs> house. And I'm like, how do you know that? She's like, Trudy told me. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about Trudy. Does she collect anything? Does she uh, inhibit your collecting or does she uh, maybe re re reel you in every now and then? And, uh, or does she have to reel you in every now and then? Tell me a little bit about Trudy. Uh, she doesn't really collect a whole lot. I know her mom bought her, like she has a little small collection of like bells. She doesn't do toys or anything like that. Um, uh, I'd say she collects God's word. If that's the, if she's really, She's going to church all the time, and she's a very, very devoted religious person. Um, so that's yeah, she doesn't really collect any huh. physical things, really. Uh, we have so much more in common than I ever knew. <laughs> my my wife, similar to Trudy, went. Uh, yeah. Did she go to OVU too? Yeah, yeah. That's how I met my wife. She went to OVU, and she doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. She doesn't cuss. She still doesn't cuss, uh, other than sometimes at uh, at, at the, the thought of the kids moving at five in the morning. <laughs> but apart from that, it's like we. We're so polar opposites. She doesn't yeah. collect anything. Well, she she likes books. She reads books, but she doesn't collect to collect things. Right. It's weird how polar opposites can can attract, and it's nice to see another couple out there surviving being so different. Because everybody goes like, "You're not gonna. She's not gonna marry you." It's like, dude, you are like wild child smoking drinking going out on the weekends blah 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 i don't know if you did that but that yeah. was me in in my early days and she didn't reel me in it's not like i found i feel like i found my rock yeah trudy uh trudy seems like a wonderful person obviously i, I trust her with my child <laughs> little <laughs> phoenix but uh moving she on loves from... that job by the way absolutely loves your kid and loves that job <laughs> i don't think i could i don't think i could do it i took care of all my kids well, three out of the four of my kids throughout the entire pandemic. Actually, no, Phoenix wasn't even born yet. I took care of the the two kids that we had at the time throughout the pandemic. Morning to night, Judy worked. I stayed at home. This was like right as I was getting to start the detail in business and whatnot. And I couldn't imagine being with kids as my job. So hats yeah. off to anybody that works in the, in the daycare and um, child care field. Uh much respect and if you end up having like a bad day totally get it totally get it so we're gonna move on now let's talk a little bit about um mental health a little bit before we start talking about the mall and the inevitable closing of the classic plastic store at the mall and at the canton location let's talk a little bit about how you're doing i just kind of want to know kind of you know man to man checking in um that has to be crazy being told, here's your spot. We're moving another business to your spot and we're going to sit you right in front of your old spot. Yeah, that's not, crazy. I almost shed tears when I walked past it and I was like, cause just as a man, not even as a business owner, like I'm getting emotional about it now. It's like, I couldn't imagine how you have this thing that you as a business owner, you work 24 hours a day, you know, loving and nurturing and caring for and trying to make special for people, not just your, your family. You're trying to make it special for everybody that comes to your store. And then just being shoved out of it like a orphan with the, please, sir, can I have some more? It's like, how are you doing? That time had to be really hard to get through. Yeah. Uh, now I'm, I'm doing, but I'm, I'm getting there. It's, there's still a lot, uh, it's going to be a lot of work. I have a, a, a long road ahead of me. Uh, when it, when it first happened, she kind of, the lease lady kind of gave me a little bit of, of a heads up. So I had, I had a little bit longer than the 30 day 
eviction notice that they gave me. She did let me know that, hey, there are people looking at your space. So I think I had two or three weeks more than that to kind of prep. But the so they she emailed me to officially say, hey, here's your 30 day. And then um, it was either the day after or the day before uh, two dogs that I had rescued off the Emerson here where I live. I put them in my backyard, gave them back to the owner. Um, they came and killed half of my animals. And then the, I think it was the day after the or before the eviction, um, they came back and they killed the rest of them. So, like, I went... One day I was losing my store, and then the next day I lost the rest of my animals. So super was not good. <laughs> uh, now I'm trying to rebuild the store to the whatever I can, and I've slowly started to get my, some of my animals back, and hopefully the dogs are taken care of. Uh, I gave them back to the owners again, and law enforcement was involved in all that why not so i hope they they went to take the dogs from them and the owner said that they rehoused them i hope that's true i I hope i don't see them again because i do have more animals again but i did fortify my fence so if anybody says well what are you going to do they this time they should not be able to get in my yard i made sure that they couldn't but as the old adage goes there's not a bad animal it's uh, bad owners definitely i I, animals are going to be animals they're going to do what animals do yeah the owners uh, are the ones at fault for whatever uh, happens. And I'm sorry to hear about your animals. I, I I think I remember seeing something about that, but I didn't know to what extent. Yeah, it was pretty wow. vicious. And I, it, people were like, well, was, they were just chickens. What did you do? Did you butcher them and eat them? Like, I wasn't thinking about that at that point. The, I didn't get the an, those animals at the time for the intention of eating them. I, I got them to have them and to get eggs from them. So they weren't meant to be meat birds and then i had two ducks which were my those were my babies like i I raised all of them from when they were super small but the ducks had an attachment to me so anytime i went outside i heard them they ran to me um and and the female she got a she got really badly injured that first attack and i rehabilitated her on my back porch and then that second time she was all i i saw the chickens scattered all over my yard and my, my only concern was where are the ducks and I didn't hear them oh. but she had the dogs had killed her and then injured the male so I tried to rehabil- re- rehabilitate him on the porch and I think um, just out of st- injuries and stress and loss of his mate he just didn't have it in him to make it so he didn't make it through the night um, and they're all they're all buried in my backyard now so my next door neighbors have ducks and chickens as well, and and dogs. Every morning we hear the the rooster crow. I mean, anytime my kids go in the backyard, all I hear is wah, wah, wah. like they're <laughs> laughing at me. I was like, I know, I need to lose five pounds. So just, a duck and chicken as as pets. So it is definitely a thing. I have neighbors that have them, and uh, the, the loss has to be completely real. Yeah. So. Let's get into the mall situation. You've kind of filled me in off camera here about some of the backstage things going on. Um, A lot of people know some of the story. They know what you've shared. They know what they've heard. But I felt like you deserved a soapbox to kind of not only tell the real story so people can hopefully get off of it a little bit. Because at my store, like, if they're not talking about X, they're talking about Y. And if they're not talking about Y, they're talking about you, Tony. Because in my small little world, we're all connected symbiotically. Yeah. And um, people want to know. And I'm like, I don't have a clue. I want to start a (laughs) podcast so I can interview you. (laughs) That's not why we started this thing. But it's definitely what I made you my first guest for is because I want you to not only thrive and regrow rebuild from the ground up as you seem to be doing but i want you to be able to speak your truth to a wide audience one time so you don't have to do it every day of your life yeah i have i have done it a lot so hopefully the, this helps stop it so i'm going to i'm going to be done talking and i want you to just to say what you want to say i may interject here and there but uh, right. the floor is yours to let people know the truth so just basically what happened okay so uh 
the malls have two different kinds of leases. We'll just start there. The specialty lease is what I had that allows the mall to be able to boot you around whenever they want for a permanent, if a permanent lease wants their space, they can kick you out. The permanent leases are four times more than a, than a, than a, uh, an, the other lease. So the space that I was in, they, um, I, I actually went because I was afraid I was going to get kicked out. I was like, well, how much is a permanent space? So they wanted for 3,000 square foot, I was paying $2,000 a month, um, no utilities included. Um, they, they wanted me to pay to not be kicked out. They wanted me to pay $8,000 a month. Um, there's no way. I, I, on my best on my best, I've never, there's no way I would have been able to do that. Uh, so I just kind of dropped it and knew, okay, well, eventually I'm going to get kicked out. Uh, and you, you never expect, you, you never know when it's going to happen. You know, you just hope that hopefully nobody ever wants your space. Uh, unfortunately, the last few months of 2023, the mall uh, was able to brag about the fact that they were at capacity, which meant that since they had a permanent space look looking at my space that they didn't have anywhere to move me now I had been moved before I don't know if you remember I was I was moved into this tiny and it was right before they 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 have the worst timing on this too because both times was just so close to Christmas uh, that you know that's the, that's the time of the year for most retail small businesses that's when you're gonna make most of your money uh, so the the first move it definitely dropped my, my sales, but it wasn't super bad because I was still had a store. But the kiosk that I ha had to be in because there wasn't any space uh, did not go well. I don't know if you ha ha care about the kiosks in the like around Christmas time, all those pushy kiosk people that like will walk up to you and try to hand you stuff and they just won't take no for an answer, you know. That it's called a kiosk mentality. That like anytime people see a kiosk, they, their eyes automatically go back down to the floor, and they don't pay attention because they're afraid people are going to be pushy in them. That's the, every kiosk I've ever been to has been like that. I so, didn't know that was a thing, but yeah. hundred percent fact. When yeah. those people ask me about skincare products <laughs> or putting like weird, uh, like massage things yeah. on me, or or the guy that. Uh, um, does the, the airplanes flying around, want yeah. you to fly an airplane around the mall. And yeah. I either get on my phone, look to the right the, or down, <laughs> or pretend like my kid's doing something. And exactly. and they still, like, follow you. And yep. they're like, no, 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 no I'm, no, I'm not, in, not interested. And then they'll, it, it, yeah, I yeah. guess it is a thing. I, I never even thought about it's, it. It's a mental thing. And businesses, a, a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of mental things that go into uh sales like how you how you set up your store how people the flow of your store is going to dictate what sells better where you know because thing people go in a store people go a certain way and they, and it's weird to watch most people all go the same way especially with the way that i had my layout they all went to the left and then they went to the back and then they did a loop around so in a kiosk like for one, you're not normally allowed inside of a kiosk, which is something that was different than for me because I had so much inventory. Uh, there wasn't like there wasn't a way to display it well enough, so I had to open it up, yeah. and people did, for the most part, people didn't know they could walk in. Yeah. So, you tried so hard uh, to get people like every Facebook <laughs> post was come inside the kiosk, yeah. come inside the kiosk. But having so many small miniature items yeah. and and things out of box. It had to be such a challenge yeah. to get people to not only look over that you're there, but to keep people in, in the retaining. Yeah. Retaining had to be difficult. Yep. And even even if they did see me and they did come into the kiosk, I had maybe a third of the inventory that I had, and I went to I went to from three thousand square foot to like eight hundred square foot. Uh, so I ended up having to get two storage units. I'm still paying five hundred a month on storage units. That's full of it displays and all kinds of like over overstock the bunch of stuff that i have left over um so yeah so i went from so i was when i was in my space i was making those last few months that i was in there i was making 20 to thirty thousand, and then i went out to the kiosk and that first month i dropped maybe five to ten and then i went down i was making seven to eight thousand dollars a month so what people mo might not understand about what we do in, in retail and 
and reselling, if you will, um, you may have a $20,000 a month, but think about it this way. A record, because, you know, I'm going to say a record because that's what I know. A record costs me $30, and the re recommended uh, retail price is $37.99. Factor in shipping, factor in um, the fact that Amazon is out there undercutting everybody. You're lucky to make $5 profit per item. So you might have made $20,000, but profit, you may have only made a couple hundred dollars a month, it's you know, just enough to pay the bills to keep the lights on. Right. Toys have a little bit better of a markup, I think, because you have to buy buy the case. Yeah, um, it's about a 30% markup, um, but the vintage stuff is what the, you know, you can get a bigger margin because they're, we kind of dictate the price, yeah. whereas the companies, the new companies kind of dictate what we pay them, so. Yeah, if um, people don't realize it, but the reason we have giant signs say we buy collections, we buy records, we buy toys is because that's where we survive. Yeah. Amazon and Walmart of the world and places in the mall, they don't resell nostalgia. Yeah. We do. And that's how we survive. The rest of the stuff is kind of like icing on the cake. It gets new people in the door. It gets exactly. young people into the hobby, but we can't survive on the brand new sealed stuff. Right. Even at thirty percent, yeah, and it's not great because like that's thirty percent profit, but then that's thirty percent on that toy. I still have, like you said, overhead that's not net. You know, it's, I might be making thirty percent over what I paid, but that thirty percent is getting eaten up by the, if I made if I had a good month, the mall got ten percent of that, yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, so when you see those shop local and support your small businesses and things, it's not just catchphrases. Right. It it is 100% fact that the only way we survive is by people supporting us yeah. and bringing in these collections. We're not Fortune 500 companies, obviously, yeah. but um, we don't have to be to survive. You just have to have the community support, right. which is something that you've never had a problem with. You've been able to build from a kiosk to a small store to the mall. And would you think that where would you have gone if things didn't go south with the mall? Was there anything else in the future that you were maybe planning on, on building it further? Other shows, other stores? Because you seem to have your hands full. You're at, yeah. you're, you're in Athens. You're in, is it Canton? Canton. Yeah. Canton. You're uh, at the mall. You do these toy shows. You do all the different fair or conventions that come around it within a driving distance. Yeah. There couldn't have been enough time in the day to think past yeah i was i was set where i was i had more than enough to take keep me busy and uh i was just going to focus on refining everything just making it better um, you did I, every day that every time i went to that store in the mall the signage how bright and cheery it was um that that that's the most heartbreaking thing is when you walked in it was like it looked more professional than most chain big box chain stores you really truly had built something to be super proud of and everybody that i know is going to miss it dearly and i really hope that the 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 ranks thing is a way for you to build back to something who knows what yeah, don't worry about it for now you're still <laughs> you're still building your shelving and and yeah. getting going but um i really want you to to walk away from this knowing that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were affected by the store and not just in a retail sense. Um, so anyways, let's get back to the mall. They moved you to a kiosk and uh, it was again at a very unfortunate time. And um, what led to the actual closure and what's happened since? Uh, well, like I was saying, the, the sales tanked. Uh, they went from 20 to 30. Like Aaron said, they weren't, that wasn't all profit. So that's the gross um, so then I went to a $7,000 to $8,000 gross a month, which was astronomically lower. Uh, you know, that's my, my employees were almost as much as that. So I, I let, had to let my, most of my employees go. Um, I tried to stick it out as best I could. I don't know if you saw, I was trying to make pepperoni rolls with the cottage law. I was trying everything I could just to draw people, just to get sales anywhere near what they were. And it just didn't. I just couldn't. It just, they just weren't there. And everybody was saying, oh, it's just a bad economy. It's just a bad economy. I Yes, 
if I had if I were still in my store, my sales would be down, down. Agreed. How how down they were from where I was in the kiosk, going from thirty thousand to eight thousand. That's not down. That's that's like a stone, a drop in a stone. You know, that, that's just non not able to continue going from there. So. Uh, the mall, like I said, that they wanted twenty two thousand. So my, the kiosk was two thousand two. That's what I was paying for that kiosk. They were charging me the same amount of money for that tiny little kiosk that they were for the three thousand square foot store that I had. And when I asked them why, they said they were raising rent on everybody because luckily for them, quote, luckily for us, we are at capacity, which means they were price gouging people. That's exactly what that is. So I don't know. I don't know if I sound upset. I am. Uh, that's it was not cool. That's not a cool business decision. They and now when uh, you look at the mall, they have like eight empty stores, and that happened in a matter of a couple months. And it's no wonder. I I, I don't I don't uh, I, now I can see why malls are suffering. If this is how they do business, they were super supportive of small business up until they just weren't anymore. And then they got rid of uh, Work a Heart was the first one. They booted them for some super overpriced, super fancy club dress place that I don't understand. Uh, And then they booted me for, which I think is still a small business, but I don't know how they're able to, if they're charging them $8,000, I got to tell you, I don't know how they're doing it because I like rocks. I actually have a collection of rocks myself, but there was no way that that place needed 3,000 square foot for rocks. it's, it's nothing against that business. I don't know those owners. I don't know those people. Mm. Good luck to them. But like, that was not a smart decision on the mall's part, to, in my opinion. Well, I don't. I, uh, I'm going to interject that I don't think it was a smart decision on the Rock People's part for taking <laughs> over one of the most most beloved stores that our town had. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. not going to speak ill of another small <laughs> business. Right. I just feel like that was like. Wow, I can't believe that another small business would muscle yeah. another yeah. small business out of their spot like that. And the and the mall tried to get me to do that same thing. And yes, I, I guess maybe that was a mistake. People could probably see that as a mistake for me not taking it and doing the kiosk instead. Um, but they wanted me to take out that the JV Market. It's like the place right next to Dunham's. That, or is it next to Dunham's that has the like the drinks and snacks and stuff. And they, they said they didn't want really want them there anymore, and they were trying. They were like, "Well, if you want us, if you want that space, we'll just have to give them a thirty day notice, like we're giving you." And I'm like, "I'm not kicking somebody else out. You've done this to me twice. I know what it feels like. I don't, I, I, vending machines, you could put them anywhere, but I don't care. It's the it's the um, it's just not how you do business for me. Like if somebody's paying their rent, you just leave them alone. They should have just left me alone. So they didn't. They kicked me out. My sales tanked." And then I wasn't able to keep up with rent anymore. And they were giving me warnings that, oh, if you don't pay your rent, we're going to default you. I'm like, okay, well, like I said, my sales aren't there because you put me in a kiosk. So I don't know how I'm supposed to pay my rent. Um, and then th- that was that. They, they defaulted me. And I decided before they tried to take any of my inventory or do anything else that I just needed to get out. So I just, I, I went, the Canton store did the same thing. They de- defaulted me. So I went up and I packed it up. And then uh, within the next week, I packed up here and put it all in storage. And then so. you got a hold of uh, Billy. I did, yeah. And uh, he he has been awesome. The rinks move, I think, is going to be for the better. Um, it's definitely going to be difficult going from seven days of sales to three days of sales. Um, but hopefully if people follow me there and I can get – out more inventory and I can make it like maybe hopefully I can make it just as good as the mall location was. And I know for a lot of the um, retro inventory, a lot of the people around here maybe already have seen a lot of the things. So yeah. you're able to use those couple of days now to focus more on your online side of things, yeah. get a much bigger audience. Um, you were doing that anyways, but right. now you have true time right. to devote to, to that craft. Uh, feel free to share your social medias and uh, wh- where, what platforms people can support you on uh, if you want to do that. All right. Yeah. Mainly just on eBay is where we're doing a lot of our own online sales. And it's just under the store name, classic plastics toy store. Uh, I think right now we're almost to 400 listings. Uh, we've like, yeah, we've, we've done that for, a, I've had my, that account for since 
Market Street or before that. Uh, so we've been doing it, but we're trying to amp that up. Um, all of that is at my one remaining employee's house uh, because I don't have room here. Uh, she took it on herself to kind of make an office room there. Uh, so everything's being shifted over to that. Um, we have a website, but we're not selling on anything on it right now. It just has store info on it for anybody that wants to just see our see all of our info. And then I'll be traveling around. I'll probably still be doing trade shows and stuff, so I'll still be going to uh, CTS in Columbus, and hopefully I can get back to the Steel City Con in Pennsylvania. It's awesome. But I haven't vended there for years. So I hope you do too, because the the list of autographed signees at the, oh. the Steel City Con <laughs> is always the most impressive. Yeah. I um, definitely planned on going last year to see Christina Ricci, but uh, it kind of fell through. I ended Dang. up getting sick that weekend. Oh. And, uh, otherwise, I would have definitely shut the short store yeah. down to go and meet uh, my childhood crush. Yeah, I would love so, to meet her. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap things up? We have just hit the one hour mark. Is there anything else that you want people to know about? And uh, one more little plug here for the Classic Plastics Toy Show. The finale, at least for now, is happening at the Parkersburg Arts Center on March 2nd and 3rd. Tickets are just $5, and kids 10 and under are free. Tony, the floor is yours. Let people know uh, where you are in the world and um, what you want them to know before we sign off. All right. Well, I'll be in Rinky Dinks Flea Market in Marietta, Ohio. That's uh, right on Route 7 there, so it's right outside of downtown. So Aaron and I will actually be pretty close to each other from now on. Uh, we're in aisle 5 of that, and the days and hours are Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 9 to 5, and we're going to be open... I know a lot of people at rinks, if you go to rinks, you know a lot of people aren't open. That's not me. That's a huge pet peeve. If my hours are posted, that's when I'll be open. Uh, other than that, uh, I appreciate Thank you for everybody that supported me. Thank you, Aaron, for doing this. Uh, I hope everybody has fun listening to all of my ramblings. And hopefully I'll see you at Rinky Dinks. All right. And with that, the dog is telling me it is time to sign off. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for listening. And uh, I'm going to go look at some chickens. Everybody have a great day. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I did. It was great to be able to sit down with Tony and kind of talk about uh, all the things that I've been wondering and just kind of get to know him a lot better. He's a great guy, and I wish nothing but the best for him. And um, go and see him up at Ranks, and definitely come and see us at the Classic Plastics Toy Show and Expo, which is evidently going to be the very last one, at least for the time being. Um, which is coming up, as, as you heard, March 2nd and 3rd at the Parkersburg Arts Center. And um, this is where we're going to sign off. I hope to see you next week. We're going to try to put out these episodes weekly on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. So be watching your socials and follow us on Facebook at First City Podcast. And thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you next week. Make sure to shop local. You've been listening to the First City Podcast you live from First City Records. Thank you for joining us and come back next week.